coming into this debate, I was definitely focused on how trustworthy are the candidates, and I think that's still my main issue. And I thought this was a great civil debate, and like how mu how trustworthy I think the candidates are grew for both of them, in my opinion. Um, I think that there's still so many issues at hand with uh, international politics. It, it is very important that we have expertise when making these decisions in policy, right? It was warm and fuzzy. I mean, you could watch it and not be offended. Brace yourselves, my friends, because today we are going to dive into the dense minds of swing state voters who are still undecided. In October, with just 34 days until the election, and we're going to hear what they had to say about last night's vice presidential debate. And just to warn you, this is going to be very depressing, especially because these uninformed imbeciles are going to decide the outcome of the election for all of us since their votes matter more than ours thanks to our antiquated electoral system. And to add insult to injury, they claim to care about policy, but they offer the most hollow analyses imaginable that is purely vibes based. I'm not making this up and I'll show you why that's what they believe in a minute. But I want to start with the insufferable CNN panel that you just heard from where seven undecided voters from the state of Michigan, very important state. They watched the debate and just one came away decided. So most of them still undecided. Now, as you're going to see, they're still undecided because they came away liking both J.D. Vance and Tim Walls more after the debate. So it's so much more difficult for them, you know, um, and the reason why they like them more is not necessarily because of their policy positions, but because both seemed super duper nice. Case in point. Um, so coming into this debate, I was definitely focused on how trustworthy are the candidates. And I think that's still my main issue. And I thought this was a great civil debate and like how much, how trustworthy I think the candidates are grew for both of them in my opinion, but the one thing that stuck out to me was Vance's refusal to say whether or not Trump lost the 2020 election, and then also how he kind of said that carbon may not cause climate change, and kind of just his refusal to agree with those things that most people very clearly see makes me think he's not as trustworthy, but I did like a lot of his other policies. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's try to parse this out a little bit. She trusts them both more after the debate, even though J.D. Vance wouldn't tell the truth about Trump losing the 2020 election or wouldn't admit the most basic common sense thing ever, that greenhouse gas emissions contribute to climate change. But despite this, she now somehow trusts J.D. Vance more, along with Tim Walls, after saying trustworthiness is her main concern. And she's still ultimately undecided because she agrees with some of his other policies. Sweetie, what are we doing? What's, what's going on here? First of all, where have you been? Is this the first time that you've heard about Trump or Vance's election denialism? Because he's been saying the same shit for four fucking years at this point. So are you, are you literally only realizing now that they're denying the result of the last election? Because that's, that's pretty troubling, right? That contributes to why you're undecided. But help me understand why it's only standing out to you now. Have you just not known? Have you been living in a cave, just not following it? Why are you now like, oh, wow, seems like he's kind of against the election and might be a threat to democracy. And I'm sorry, what other policies of his do you agree with? Mass deportation to bring down the cost of housing? Does that make sense to you? Trickle down economics? Drill, baby, drill? Why are you incapable of making up your mind this late in the game? Even by your own fucking standards, your mind should be made up. But nope, you're still undecided. These are the types of people who are going to decide the election. God damn. Okay, moving on. There's another undecided voter. Uh, and they liked the moment when Tim Walls said that experts should be making decisions. And he reacted strongly to this during the debate which is why the CNN host asked him about it. Here's what he had to say. Well, it, it is very important that we have expertise when making these decisions in policy, right? And so him bringing, bringing um, the specifics to say that we need the expertise um, making these decisions, I, I believe that was very important. And that in, in, that in turn made me, you know, turn my favorability towards him. So that's what did it? Really? Tim Walls saying we need to listen to experts when it comes to policymaking? That's what made you say, oh, wow, I'm really leaning more towards him now, but still not sure. 
Okay. But even though, you know, uh, that random moment from the debate, which was a highlight for me when Tim Wall said we should listen to the experts, admittedly, even though that got him all hot and bothered, he's still not decided. So if that's so important to you, then why not decide to go with the person who is saying, yeah, maybe let's trust the experts as opposed to not trusting the experts on these complicated matters. I don't know why you're just, you're not decided after saying you like that, right? Maybe he wants to hear about Trump's thoughts on expertise. Maybe he, he needs to know what Trump thinks about this specifically. But my brother in Christ, just admit that you're not really following the election. That's okay. I think it's perfectly understandable. We all have busy lives. It's hard to follow along when there's so much bullshit and so much misinformation. Not everybody can consume politics to the point where their brain has rotted to the point that mine has. But it just feels like you produced a book report there at the last minute, even though it's painfully obvious that you didn't read the material. So I just feel like what you're saying, it reeks of bullshit, but there's more. There are two main things that I really value about my family and our baby daughter that is being born soon. Um, one is health and two is time. Um, with health, like I want to be assured that my wife and daughter are going to be healthy and safe. Time, I would love to spend time with my daughter, um, maybe through a medical leave. But um, for those two, it would be really unfortunate if I can't afford it in the first place. So any kind of assistance to that and to my family and to allow me to enjoy the health of my family as well as to spend time with my family would definitely help me decide with my vote. And look, I think that that is perfectly reasonable. If only one of the two candidates last night proposed a $6,000 child tax credit, paid family leave at the federal level and additional subsidies for the Affordable Care Act. Oh wait, Tim Walls did do that. He talked about those policies specifically that you say you want, but yet you're still undecided. What? Maybe you don't actually support the policies you say you support after all, because if you did, you would have already made up your mind after hearing the candidate say, these are the policies I support, and then saying, oh, these are the policies I want. But you're undecided. It feels like you're there because you like feeling important and want both sides to try to woo you. But I promise you, this is it. This is as good as it gets. The Democratic Party's position on healthcare is woefully inadequate. They should be supporting Medicare for all, but they don't. But they're better than Republicans. The Republican Party's position is effectively fuck you die. That's the choice before you. So it's time to make a decision. Either shit or get off the pot. If you care about family policies, one candidate articulated what he wants to do clearly. And the other had word salad and bloviated. So I guess I, I just find it hard to understand why you're undecided if you're like, I support policy X. And then a candidate is like, I support policy X. And you're like, oh, OK, I'm still undecided. It doesn't make any sense You understand why I, I feel a little bit confused by, by your position. But I do want to hear from another undecided who uh, says that foreign policy is his main issue. Um, the biggest thing that I'm still looking at is, is foreign policy um, and international relations. Um, watching the debate today, it was touched on for maybe six minutes total, um, only on the breaking news that was happening in Iran today, or in Israel today, um, with Iran attacking them. Um, I think that there's still so many issues at hand with uh, international politics and seeing how um, our president, uh, our possible president, and our vice president possibility um, would react to those situations is extremely crucial. Um, looking at uh, Ukraine and Russia, and yeah. uh, looking at China and Taiwan, um, not just focusing on the attacks today, but kind of looking at international relations as a whole um, is still probably one of the heaviest part of, of uh, my decision. I get it. I mean, they didn't spend nearly as much time talking about foreign policy as they needed to at this debate. But the really good news that I have for this person is that the candidates have talked elsewhere at length about their foreign policy positions. And all it'll take is a mere 30 minutes or so to basically get a quick rundown if you decide to do a little bit of research, right? If you decide to look into the positions 
on policies that you claim to care a lot about. Sure, it's hard to discern what Trump would do since he's a know-nothing narcissist who makes every international issue about him and it happened because, you know, he's not in power. So I get it that they're not necessarily clear all the time. Politicians use doublespeak. But at this point, you're not going to learn much more than what's already out there, right? You're choosing between who's going to oversee a genocide in Gaza and regional war in the Middle East and whether or not we will continue to send material support to Ukraine. I think that it's clear where both parties stand. All you have to do is spend a tiny bit of time researching it. But I mean, you seemingly haven't done that. And now you're like, oh, wait, they didn't talk about this one issue more at this debate. Well, there's more happening than the, the debate. And again, I understand that it's difficult to pay attention because there's a lot happening. We have lives. But let's cut the bullshit. I don't think you know what you want. None of these people do. They all are full of shit. OK, that's what I'm saying, because the entire panel was smitten by how respectful both of the candidates were. And that had no bearing on policy whatsoever. So spare me this bullshit about what policies you purport to support when you're like, oh my God, they're so fucking nice to each other. I mean, listen to this bullshit. I haven't seen a debate like this in a very long time. They supported each other. Um, they were kind and it was warm and fuzzy. I mean, you could watch it and not be offended by the words they were using towards each other. And I think to that point, one of the striking things when we were looking at the data uh, in terms of your guys' responses is your favorability for both candidates, regardless of how you viewed them coming into the night, went up significantly. Johannes, why? So um, mainly, I think, just the way that they did a debate. Like, it, like it, just mainly that they did an actual debate in, in front of me. There was not much fear. There was not much hesitancy. They showed their characters to each other in a way. Um, and as was mentioned, they kind of supported each other as they're going within the debate and not attacking each other personally, but more of the policies and then what they stand for. I'll be honest. I fucking hate these people. <laughs> I hate them. Like, what, do you, what the fuck? You're going to be the deciding voters in this country when you're like, oh, they were so nice to each other. Who cares? I don't give a shit. This right here is everything wrong with American politics, right? As long as both sides are getting along and the fascist who's threatening mass deportation is polite and respectable, then everything is copacetic. Yay! I mean, this is how so many people, including liberals, end up supporting policies against their own self-interest. For example, with liberals, they're now supporting Republican policies because it's being proposed by a Democrat, right? Albeit without the bombastic demagoguery. It's more digestible because the candidate who is saying they support this terrible thing is saying it nicely. Case in point, the Republican border bill that Harris and Walls continue to push. This bill is illegal. You are required by law to hear asylum claims, but the bill would shut down the border and in turn shut down due process for people if some arbitrary threshold is crossed. That's not supposed to happen, but yet they're saying we support this as if it's a good thing and not something that they should, they should be ashamed of, right? So we need to be able to cut through the bullshit and obfuscation and differentiate between policies and platitudes. And certainly nobody in this fucking panel was able to do that. But I think that they're a microcosm of a broader issue in this country. It feels like Americans would let the government subject everybody to cock and ball torture so long as both parties politely agreed that it was the correct course of action. But at the same time, we're also hyperpolarized, so it just doesn't really make sense. And if you're an international viewer struggling to follow along and try to understand what makes us tick, um, we're all confused. Nobody knows. We don't even know ourselves, right? It doesn't make any sense. Now, up until this point, I haven't actually told you who the one voter is that actually made up their fucking minds after watching the debate. And I'm going to have a little bit of criticism of this person, but I won't be as mean since he actually is making up his mind. But first, let's hear his reasoning. All seven of you came in undecided. One of you said they've made up their mind. Ryan, who do you who are you going to vote for, and, and what kind of solidified that opinion? Well, I'm going to be voting for Kamala Harris. You know, uh, one of the stark sort of aspects of that debate that really stuck with me was when they were talking about January 6th and how Mike Pence certified the election, and they were wondering if J.D. Vance would certify the election should Trump lose. And you know. J.D. Vance didn't really give us a definitive answer, and I, I'm disappointed in that fact. And I don't think that I can trust someone, you know, with my vote if they're not going to respect it. You did it. 
You did it, sir. You actually made up your goddamn mind. Sincerely, thank you. Turns out the threat to democracy that J.D. Vance poses is what helped him decide. Now, I'm not going to be mean because he actually came to a conclusion about what he's going to do, but I could blow your mind about some of the shit that Donald Trump and J.D. Vance have said over the course of the last four years, but I'm not going to nitpick because you're no longer undecided. But I am wondering if you just this i'm trying not to be a prick but i am wondering if you, if you decided to just tune in like now right it's a little bit weird that you're like oh they're a threat to democracy only now having said that though i still applaud you because you set standards and then you made a decision based on your own observations and standards that is what you are supposed to do but yet six of the other people did not do the same thing and what's so worrying about that is this election is so close and it could ultimately come down to the vibes each campaign is putting out like literally it's worrying because you know even if trump loses this election someday a polite charming fascist could roll this fucking country by weaponizing our own gullibility against us but even though I've been a prick to those seven undecided voters, it's really nothing personal. Honestly, I'm frustrated because they are emblematic of a broader problem in American politics. And I say this because what they said was represented in CNN's post-debate snap poll. As you can see, both candidates came out of the debate better than where they started. You know, the swing was bigger for Walls, which is good because he's now at plus 37 when he was at plus 14 before the debate. But Vance also made an important gain. He was at negative 22 and he's now at minus three after the debate. So he's less disliked now, which is still bad, but it's very positive for him. That's the kind of movement you want to see if you're a candidate underwater. But overall, most polls showed that the debate was basically a wash. Vance edged out in some, Walsh edged out in focus group polls. So I think that trying to figure out where undecided voters are at is really important. Now, I want to move on because the uh, undecided voters struck again in a panel from the Washington Post, they talked to 22 undecided voters in swing states. And as you can see, eight think that Walls won the debate and 14 think that Vance won the debate. But let's get to some specific takeaways from these 22 undecided voters. So when it comes to the question of, do you agree with Walls that Trump tried to overturn the last election? Most actually do seem to agree somewhat or strongly. But I mean, it doesn't really matter because it is an objective fact that Trump tried to overturn the last election, so their opinions are irrelevant here. But nonetheless, here's what they said. Corey, who disagrees somewhat, says, the media obscured the event, protesters were allowed into the buildings, and Trump never directly commanded anyone to overturn the allegedly fair election. Okay, so, um... Are you really that undecided? Because you sound like a Trump Kool-Aid drinker. Moving on, Taylor, who neither disagrees or agrees with that statement, says, I don't really think the election was fair, but I do think Trump influenced people to protest that way. Okay. When it comes to who made better arguments on health care, 15 said Walls and 8 said Vance. It should be all 22 saying Walls since Vance's proposal was barely coherent. But Taylor, who thinks that Vance put forward better arguments, says, quote, I lost my state health care after Biden became president because I make too much money. I was on state health care under Trump, making the same amount of money and was never kicked off. I cannot afford health care. Something needs to be done. So let's pause for a moment so I can talk directly to Taylor for a moment. Taylor, I know you're watching. Um, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. You do know that state health care, which is Medicaid, is run by your state and not the president, right? We know this. I mean, technically, it's a federally and state run program in the sense that the state runs the program and the federal government lays out specific parameters. But it's not Biden's fault that you happen to no longer qualify for Medicaid when he was president. I mean, you can make the case that he hasn't done enough to remedy the situation and healthcare is too unaffordable, even if you buy it on the exchanges. I would agree with you. I think that Biden is insufficient. Democrats in general aren't good enough on this issue. But you are leaning towards the party who wants to take away subsidies for the program like the one that you benefited from. You know this, right? It says in her profile that she's still undecided, but probably voting for Donald Trump. OK, if healthcare is such an important issue, why would you vote for somebody who only says he has a concept of a plan? I think that Kamala Harris's plan is insufficient, doesn't go far enough. But you're choosing to go with somebody who has a concept of a plan. Really? Furthermore, I agree with you that healthcare is very important. But it says you're 29 years old. So let me ask you this. Did you support Bernie Sanders four years ago when he was running on Medicare for all? What about eight years ago in 2016? You would have been old enough to vote for him. 
So did you support Bernie Sanders? Because if healthcare is this massive issue to you, which it is, it's an issue to all of us because it's a crisis in this country. Um, why wouldn't you support the candidate? I'm making an, an assumption. Uh, why wouldn't you support the candidate that was literally running on healthcare being free at the point of service for all of us? We would all have healthcare. It would be comprehensive. See, this is what really frustrates me about Americans. We complain about things, rightfully so. Um, we complain, and then we vote for corporate Democrats who don't support policies like Medicare for All, which would benefit all of us. Or we vote Republican uh, who don't even support Obamacare, which is exponentially worse than just not supporting Medicare for All. I mean, Obamacare is the bare minimum, but just saying we should expand Obamacare is almost insulting because that's so woefully inadequate that it should be disqualifying, but that's the best we get in this election cycle. But I mean, I, I just feel like I don't know what to tell you, right? We had two chances to elect Bernie Sanders who was running on healthcare being free at the point of service and Americans all said no. So I don't know what you want me to say. Maybe it's not important to you as you say it is. You know, we keep fucking ourselves over while complaining about the things that we want to get better, but then we don't vote for the candidates because of some bullshit. Oh, Bernie Sanders is a socialist. He wants to take away your guns. Like we always find these little niche issues. Oh, maybe, but you know, he, he wants to trans the kids. And then we'll, we're like, oh, you know what? Well, because of that social issue, I want to vote against my own self-interest. It's very frustrating to me. So I feel like if you're going to complain about these issues, stop voting for the candidates who are making them demonstrably worse, right? Okay. So there's a couple more from the Washington Post we're going to get to now that I've finished talking directly to Taylor. Almost all of them disagreed with fans saying that abortion should be left up to the states, which is an indication that his attempt to save face on this issue by saying it should be left up to the states has absolutely not worked, which is encouraging to see. Although when you move on to uh, immigration, you begin to see that J.D. Vance's fascist mass deportation policy apparently resonated with most of them, which is gross. But, you know, Americans going to American. They even agreed with Vance's gish galloping on climate change, even though this was particularly a strong area of the night for walls, in my opinion. Now, on U.S. policy towards Israel and Iran, they overwhelmingly agreed with Vance. And I will admit that this was one of walls lowlights, although Vance was also bad. But again, I mean, we're talking about undecided voters who vote based on vibes and sometimes sheer bravado just fucking works unfortunately but that's all i've got for you when it comes to undecided voters in very important states they're still undecided although some of them are leaning in uh, the wrong direction uh, not all of them but some of them but since i've tortured you uh with insufferable dog shit takes from these undecided dipshits i do want to leave you with a little bit of a palate cleanser and remind you that not all americans have their heads up their asses in fact the assessment from a college student that you're going to see actually gave me a lot of hopium and uh this is a college student who isn't necessarily undecided but he participated in a panel and they were just trying to gauge enthusiasm um, among college students. And I think that what he says here, just shutting down the stupidity that we saw at the debate was really encouraging. So I'm gonna leave you with what he had to say. He's already, he's already upset about it. The vice president being in office for all these years and not being able to make the change was the allegation from J.D. Vance. You said to me, I've been to high school civics class. Why did you say that? Because if anybody took high school civics class, they'd know what the vice president can do and what the vice president can do. I want to make a quick point. Neither candidate on that stage talked about what executive action they're going to take on day one to do what they want. Nor were they asked because they know that they can't. That's not how the vice presidency works. You don't get to do what you want. You do what the president delegates you to do. Recovery mode, my brain ideas. Recovery mode, my brain ideas.